group of people here. Uh, guys, this is going to be live streamed on YouTube. So uh, uh, please be advised. Um, you are going to be a group of people here. Oops. No, I have to. Uh, guys, this is going to be live streamed. On... Oops, sorry. Um, Caroline, the floor is yours whenever you want to start. Okay, well, well, thank you, Roberto, and uh, welcome everyone to our online mini course and workshop for a manifesto for the Just City, organized by TU Delft in collaboration with several universities around the world, and it's really super nice to, to see you here and welcome you. Um, and we uh, organizing also in collaboration with UN Habitat World Urban Com Campaign to commemorate Urban October and with Paca Zesweger, a cultural platform in Amsterdam that ho hosts activities connected to the topic of the cities for all. So we are extremely glad to have you here again and ha happy that many of you have also decided to really participate in the writing of the manifesto. And the links to the previous uh, um, uh, publications will also be put in the chat uh, together with some additional uh, questions. So as Roberto already said, I'm, I'm Caroline Newton. And for me, space, people and time are really tightly connected in our cities. It makes up the big complicated picture in which urban planners and designers are asked to step in. With their strategic plans and designs for neighborhoods, they affect how people live in the city in the everyday. And this brings to the forefront that urban planning and urban design cannot and should not just be technical fields. We really need to think about how people use and experience space in their daily lives and what those uses mean symbolically as well. Planning as an engaged practice also means that the spatial designer act actively works towards the goals of Habitat 3 and more specifically the new urban agenda. And this commitment to sustainable and just development of cities, towns, and human settlements means that we are working to build socially integrated and fair societies for the future. Architects, planners, and designers should consider their place in the process. And as Faranak Miraftar, who's here with us, uh, so rightly has argued before, the professional planner is no longer the hero of the urban design practice. Rather, it's a community-based process and the associated tactics and activism. They have the power to reshape the city to co-creation with residents. So our goal in writing this manifesto is to develop our critical and reflexive thinking skills so that we can be more effective when we build and try to prepare for more equitable futures in collaboration with others. Roberto, I think Thanks, you Caroline. To... Uh, well, my name is Roberto Rocco. I'm an associate professor of spatial planning at TU Delft in the Netherlands. And uh, well, uh, we organized this manifesto because we think we are living in unprecedented times, marked by climate change, pandemics, violence, and the breakdown of the environment all of which are leading to forced migration, increased inequality, and the erosion of democracy. Our world is currently undergoing a series of shocks that are interrelated. And for the first time in human history, these shocks endanger our very survival on this planet. These shocks have one thing in common. They are all the result of human activity and could have been prevented if we had listened to the findings of science, if we had sought to reach a consensus, if we had fostered our democracies, and if we had listened to the cries of those who are oppressed, as well as the cries of nature. And if we had worked more diligently to make our world more just. This workshop takes the stance that justice and sustainability are intricately bound with one another for the simple reason that justice lays the foundation of sustainability. The London School of Economics professor Romola Saniao, however, reminds us that this commitment to justice also requires us to open up discussion with other regions of the world as equals. So this is very, very important for us. Uh, this is an exercise of collective vision making, collective uh, 
aspiration for the just city and we want to make a global conversation of people around these topics and that is precisely what the goal of this workshop is to foster dialogue among different people from different parts of the world as equals working together to imagine different kinds of futures and trying to escape the last territory of colonization the imagination of alternative mm -hmm. futures as our guest, Professor Faranap Miraftha, reminds us. Caroline, over to you. Yeah, today we also want to pay tribute to our friends and colleagues in Ukraine who are waging a battle to preserve their nation and culture mm -hmm. and the right to live in peace. And we also wish to honor our Iranian friends and colleagues who are fighting against an oppressive regime that undermines women's rights. We want to investigate the question of justice and we can't do it without confronting the great injustices of our day. But to achieve a better world, we have to be able to imagine it. And in order to imagine this better world, we need to articulate our ideas so other people can partake in our imagination. We need a better and a new collective vision for cities and communities. Cities and communities that are just inclusive and sustainable. And as a team uh, of uh, the Center for the Just City here at the TU Delft and the Urban Global Lab, which is the TU Delft platform to discuss issues of uh, urban urbanization in the global south, we are also supported by the Delft Global Initiative and the Spatial Justice Network. And so we, we hope that uh, together, as an ever-growing sort of community, we can really um, develop these just and more sustainable urban futures. And today we have a very special guest, Professor Clarissa Freitas from the Federal University of Ceará in Fortaleza in Brazil, who is going to speak to us about insurgent planning in Fortaleza. But before we listen to Clarissa, we will hear um, Professor Faranak Miraftap, who will address the events in Iran, and being an Iranian herself, although she has lived and worked in the US for many years. And for those of you who are, who are not familiar, Professor Miraftap is a professor of urban and regional planning at the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign, with a concentration in community development for social justice and transnational planning. Her scholarship is situated at the intersection of sociology, geography, planning, and feminist studies using case study and ethnographic methodologies. Her research concerns social and institutional aspects of urban development and planning that address basic human needs, including housing and urban infrastructure and services that support it. So please, uh, Faranak, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I want to um, thank um, the organizers, yourself, Roberto, and the collective for having me to impinge on the time for uh, the first uh, opening uh, session. And uh, I promise to not be longer than uh, five minutes or just a brief comment on putting the, you know, as you said, we are having this conversation in the uh, context of actual. Uh, struggles happening in Iran, and I see it as those um, in, insurgent practices of citizenship that are playing out in, as we are talking about, you know, how there are ways in which cities and are shaped outside the um, control of the urban planners, but by practices of people. So it was, I was very glad when Roberto asked that I could take five minutes and talk about uh, the insurgent context of our seminar series, and especially since Clarissa and our next speaker both are talking about insurgent practices. So thank you. I want to first emphasize how important is having this kind of conversation on collective visioning uh, for a future that is just sustainable and inclusive because we are facing forces of capitalism, racism, sexism that always is trying to limit our imagination as accepting that this is there is no alternative to this. So platforms like this, which is open, free to 
public from anywhere in the world to be part of a conversation and also a collective visioning exercise is truly an active act of defiance. And I congratulate uh, the collective for holding these meetings every, every year. Um, and um, for, for uh, um, from there, I want to just take a couple of minutes and talk about what is happening in Iran, because I'm not sure that the mainstream media around the world is giving adequate coverage of what is uh, playing out in the streets of Iran. And so I hope you, you bear with me. Uh, <clears throat> As uh, many of you might have uh, been following the news, but uh, the 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 killing of the the this round of revolts started uh, now um, uh, thirty days ago with the killing of a twenty two year old uh, young woman from Kurdistan who uh, was um, taken to by by morality or hijab police. Uh, to custody and beaten uh, so that she she went into coma and and died and uh, was killed and then following that from you know it, it, from the morning that happened in Kurdistan then spread of protests in other cities of the country not only capital city but also cities that have been known for being very conservative or religious like Qom which is the headquarter of the clergy, as well as Mashhad and other parts of the country, have been protests by young men and women um, wanting to, with a very progressive and important slogan that is behind me, uh, woman, uh, life, and freedom. Uh, since these protests, there have been attacks even not only on the streets and live ammunition against the young people, but also attacks within the schools, high schools. As of you know, a few days ago, there was a school girl killed inside his school by, by police that attacked the school. And um, this is really um, killing of, of children, young people under the age of 18, high school kids. Now there are more than 20 children killed by, by, by so-called police. Uh, a lot of them are with a you know, uh, private kind of uh, outfit and we don't know really, um, you can't track them. So uh, in the, the, the Lot, massive number of arrests put in as political prisoners in Evin prison and in all sorts of political prisons in uh, other uh, cities of the country. So there is a mass, uh, mass oppression happening, but as in response to it is also an important organizing and a resistance uh, for, for women, life and freedom. That is um, not in part uh, limited, it's a trans culture, a uh, trans uh, class. There is a not a middle class movement, but also the poor people, the middle classes. The, uh, there is a very uh, kind of broad alliance and unity of voices in this respect. Ethnically, there are various ethnic groups also involved and in participating in this. So it is very important to notice that the nature of this round of revolts and um, protests is quite unifying of the country as a whole. What I want to emphasize and I think is important is that as in our feminist teachings, we always try to come to, to teach that um, feminism and women's liberation also liberates men. And this was a kind of an abstract theoretical notion, but today in the streets of the, of the country in Iran, you see that in practice, there are young men and women together raging this uh, slogan of woman, life, and freedom, which symbolizes really the three important rights that all of constitutions and formal uh, constitutional laws claim to, to guarantee. Woman, which symbolizes social rights, life, which is the struggle of people for just livelihood, a dignified livelihood, 
and uh, their substantive rights and freedom, which is you know, symbolizing the political rights. So these three dimensions of social substantive and political rights, which is something that formal constitutions have been promising. And oftentimes they have not been um, able to, pe people have had to claim them on the streets. I have written a lot about it in a South African context that has one of the most progressive constitutions, but still doesn't deliver people have to claim it and practice it on the streets on their own hands to somewhere like Iran that doesn't have that kind of progressive constitutional law. And we see that still people have to practice in the streets claim. So it's very, I just wanted to uh, round up and close by emphasizing that what is happening in Iran today is those kind of insurgent practices of citizenship and democracy that is not granted from above or outside, but is emerging from everyday practices of people. And for that, a transnational consciousness and solidarity is key. And this transnational solidarity is as peers. We don't want Western feminists to, to teach or, or think that they can guide this. We don't want Western any sort of um, in, uh, influence, but we do want civil society solidarity as, as exchanges because we are in this together. Where I'm talking from two hours from here, a woman does not have control over their body to be pregnant or not be pregnant, to bear a child or not bear a child. So the struggle of women in US who have lost their, their autonomy over their body is is very similar to has many shared aspects with the struggle of women in for their autonomy over their body in the context of Iran. Similarly, we have this struggle in India where uh, uh, Hindu uh, fundamentalism is banning women from going with Islamic um, uh, outfit to school, and we have the opposite in Iran. So there are all sorts of this uh, kind of impinging of patriarchal domination and control of women that we see here in what some will call feminist revolution that is not limited to women, women and men for all sorts of rights are uh, struggling in Iran is symbolized and really they need, we need their voices to be amplified wherever in the world we are, please amplify their just um, struggles for a just, sustainable and um, inclusive a city which is not separate from an, a just and sustainable and inclusive world. I don't want to take more time. And thank you so much for allowing me to amplify the voices of people in Iran. Please, please, please take as much time as you want. It's really, really important uh, what mm -hmm. you just told us. I, I just want to highlight two things that you said. I think uh, men also suffer with uh, toxic masculinity and with the patriarchy. Mm -hmm. Uh, they are also prisoners in some in some ways, and I think it's also very important to highlight the fact that Iran doesn't need uh, people from the West telling them anything what to do. But we have to respect and uphold uh, our and, and honor our friends from Iran, right? I yes, think. we can learn from each other and we can support each other as peers. That's what, you know, I think is the kind of transnationalism that uh, we advocate. And I'm glad that you're emphasizing that in this fight, we see that how it's a model where men are also on the streets for similar, you know, uh, realizing that their rights are tied with the liberation of women as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any quick questions to Professor Miraftab? If not, of course, you can also write your questions in the chat and we will try to answer you as quickly as possible, hum humanly possible. But now uh, over to you, Caroline. Okay, well, thank you, Roberto. And um... I would like now to introduce our speaker, Professor Clarissa Freitas, who will talk about insurgent planning in Fortaleza. And Clarissa is an urban planning scholar at the Federal University of Seattle. Sorry if I pronounce it not in the right way, uh, in Fortaleza in Brazil. And she works at the intersection of urban design policies and the political economy of urbanization. 
She has recently conducted research on the challenges that informal settlements pose to planning policies. She researches and collects data in community action pro projects in informal settlements. And so now the floor is yours, Clarissa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline, Roberto, uh, Saranac, and all the others in the group. I really feel that I am among friends here. I uh, feel so that we have, you know, a, a very strong convergence of perspective of how we see you know, the major challenges that we face today. Um, and of course, it is a great honor to, to, to talk right after Professor Farnak Mraftad, which is uh, somebody very special to everything that I know today and everything that I do, as you're going to see in my presentation. So let me share my screen here. Okay, Is it, are you seeing? Okay. Yes, I just. Yes, we can do it. Uh, okay, now I get it. So, uh, this is the title of something that I have organized to present to you today. Uh, I thought about writing or oh, speaking, you know, talking about legitimizing formal settlements under current Brazilian context of urban citizenship erosion. And it's, it's really a great challenge to, you know, speak of a progressive, you know, a positive vision in the current context of Brazil, which in, in some ways it's, it's similar and it's also very different from what Faranak just presented to us about the, the context of Iran. And we've also mentioned something about the context of Ukraine, you know, and all the, these challenges that we've been facing in, in our only world, because we just have this world. So uh, Brazilian context now, it's, it's not a very promising one. And um, so I have called it a context of erosion of citizenship. And I, I, I choose to talk about this because for me, in form of settlement legitimacy, there's pro, close relation with democratic urban governance. So if you are under an authoritarian uh, regime, uh, informal settlements, poor settlements, you know, precarious settlements, favelas tend to be criminalized. And today we are in a context, you no know, sense 2000, you know, since mid, mid 2010s, we have been at the fast erosion of something that we have built with, you know, very, with a lot of pride. We have built a, a, a sustainable democratic political regime that is now under fierce attack. And these are some pictures, and of, this is the only slide that I'm going to talk about this, but it's important for, you know, people who are not following Brazilian politics to understand that we are in the middle of national elections here, and current president is running and it has real possibility of being reelected. And he uh, embodies this uh, kind of protest and, and thinking for a demand for a more authoritarian regime. You know, here in the sign it says, well, it's in English. So it says, yeah, use Brazilian armed forces and dismiss the ministers of the, the, the Federal Supreme Court. Also, people is really going to the streets to demand this kind of stuff, which is amazing. I mean, I haven't seen this in my lifetime in Brazil. So we are in this context of erosion of public sphere that I haven't seen here. Probably my parents have seen here, you know, some a lot of decades ago, but now we are facing this again, and it's really bad. <laughs> so. Um, so, but we have, I mean, and, and this is what I think that converges our way of, you know, seeing the, the problems that we face. We just don't have the luxury to give up on utopia. I mean, we need, we, in order for us to change anything, if we give up uh, dreaming, we give up, you know, uh, trying to do something. So this is Brazilian... Uh, educator from a northeastern state close to Fortaleza, Paulo Freire. And he says that in, in a country like Brazil, just to keep being hopeful is in itself a revolutionary act. And that is what we, you know, holds 
together thinking that we have to keep holding, um, being hopeful. And universities do have uh, occupy a, a very privileged position in, in the, the construction of a collective utopia. And I speak from the university. So that, that is what I want to you know, present or trying to present something that we have been trying to do here to, to change and to transform the way that we think and we plan our cities. So these, these two books are some of my major you know, um, theoretical background that you know that hooks that where right, I guide my 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 thinking and uh, planning has everything to do with utopia as planning is I mean we understand urban planning and urbanism or urban design as a, a, an attempt of coordination toward a collectively shared dream. So uh, in, in itself you know the activity of planning of, of designing something is to improve and ameliorate something. So, and also the John Friedman's definition is to transform knowledge to action in public domain. And we have seen, I mean, John Friedman talks a lot about this, how uh, private rationalities are used to respond in the public sphere. And that is one of the main problems that we, we can't uh, implement planning because planning is very influenced by private rationality. So there is, you know, this um, oh, very present tension between market-based planning and collective-based uh, knowledge that we have always have been um, demanded to push for a more collective-based way of thinking in how we, we coordinate the land use, you know, and, and the distribution of resources of our cities. Uh, and what I... In, in our reflections here, in looking into the, the challenges of Fortaleza, what we have been seeing is that uh, the dominant planning vision is, of course, very exclusionary uh, it, it, because it imports guidelines from industrialized nations, leaving behind the low-income residents of informal settlements. These uh, residents, they become second-class citizens. Uh, and I, when I'm talking about urban citizens, I'm talking about you know people who have rights, a system of rights and obligations towards collectivity in regards to the process of city building and transformation, mediated by state through investment and regulations of the use of land. So in this picture here, what I have is that I have you know the design of an approved subdivision in a middle-income uh, neighborhood of, of my hometown, Fortaleza. And on the second picture, I have, you know, the actually existing built environment. And, and I mean, people needed to build smaller houses, you know, then this more complicated urban morphology in order to survive because land is very uh, expensive. But then, then when you see this, the, the sewer system network, you see that these more uh, dense segments, they are not provided with the sewer system. So even though the neighborhood has access to, to this infrastructure, as you are precarious, informal, you don't have the rights to these networks, you know, to this collectively built uh, based network. And this is just, of course, a metaphor, a metaphor of how informal segments don't have the rights to I mean, to, to live in a healthy way within the cities. So if, if you don't fit in the dominant vision of planning, which is this order uh, design you know, environment, if your house is not up to code, for example, you are not there of, of all urban rights. Even address, sometimes these people don't have a formal address. So it's something that I, I like to you know, depart from. And uh, uh, this is uh, a slide. Uh, it also is some, it's a, a picture of Fortaleza. It's a, a coastal neighborhood of Fortaleza. This neighborhood that's called Praia do Futuro, meaning future, you know, beach of the future. And it was subdivided, you know, legally subdivided by this, you know, black, uh, white uh, men uh, in the, during the 60s or 70s. And the neighborhood is still look like this, so very empty plots, you know, because they, I mean, they, they have produced the land as a commodity 
and they charge very expensive for this, you know, for this land, even though they have all infrastructure. So it, it is still today, it is, you know, that the neighborhood of the future. And what is becoming is that the, what has happened is that this neighborhood has been, uh, as time passes, you know, that the informal um, has been receiving a lot of occupation on the streets and the, the public, uh, the areas that were destined for, for squares and public, uh, public spaces. So what plan has produced was you no know, exclusion. And people who want to live here, they can only afford the, the unsuitable sites. So this is of, uh, the, the logic behind the production of space in Fortaleza. And I, I, I have to say a lot of other places that I have been in and, and I have read about. So Fortaleza is a typical ordinary city, you know, in the global South. It has experienced waves of, of influx of residents from the, the cyclical droughts in the immediate countryside. Between the 70s and 80s, we've had a, a major increase in population, you know, almost double in 10 years. A great part of newcomers ended up occupying you know, the streets and, and, and the, the fragile ecosystems and the dunes. So, um, Many, uh, as in many other southern rapidly growing metropolis, planned investments and municipal regulations has been used as a technical neutral language to protect the privileges, further exacerbating urban inequalities. Uh, local researchers have documented the strategies of these powerful families. I mean, here in Fortaleza, five families hold, I mean, almost 60 or 70 percent of, of the entire land of the city. So planning has historically served to justify the, the defense of private property of these two families. Uh, so and I, I have to say that even though planning have imported planning regulations and, and, and guidelines to justify these exclusionary um, processes, the, the challenges are more related to to local elite practices then to the import of just, just a second Clarissa um, I would ask everyone to please um, mute your microphones we are listening to uh, lots of sounds so if you could please mute sorry Clarissa go on oh, that's okay Yes, so it's not it's not only the importation of you know foreign ideas. This is just part of the story. I mean, that I, I would say that the biggest part of the story is the undue influence of local elites and powerful landholders to to produce all the ex exclusion that we have been seeing here. Uh, and what happens is that you know people, low income people, they organize themselves and they occupy. Land. And I have been following this community here. In the name of the, the they, they have uh, named themselves as Raizes da Praia community, meaning the roots of the beach. And they are a group of 85 families that occupy the private land, actually, nine plots of private land. So they decided that they are not going to occupy the streets or the, the squares, they are going to occupy private land. And they told us when we, you know, uh, interviewed them and, and speak to them, and they told me that when when they occupied, it was no man's land. It had been 25 years that nobody had looked after this land. Yet in the same day that we have occupied, people came here to evict us. So they have witnessed, you know, that they have lived uh, for 25 years without nobody coming into that, that land. And it was just the, the very day that they, they have decided to occupy, they started to become threatened by addiction. And of course, I mean, they, it was a very successful movement, actually not completely successful, but they have conquered the land, which is, and it's a very uh, expensive land because it's right by the beach. So, and they say, you know, we have rights to land, to private land, not to the street land and not to the periphery. We have rights to this land because this land, the, the, the land owner of this land don't have its rights because he didn't care for 25 years. So that was their, you know, somehow successful discourse. 
to uh, to conquer their land. And they, they say that they have created roots in the beach. So it, it was a very symbolic and, and important movement. I'm not going did, to play the video is... with you for you because I don't have time. So what I what I do in what, what we try to do here in Fortaleza, I know that I don't have much time, but I'm just gonna show you a few stuff that we have been trying to do, especially with you know communities like this one that I have uh, showed you, the people from Heights da Praia, is that we do a uh, university extension policy. I, I don't even know how to translate that, but it's a kind of outreach, you know, initiative that Brazilian universities are allowed to do because it, we have, uh, as I told you, we have come from a very progressive and democratic moment in Brazilian uh, democratic history. And we have devised not only a progressive urban legislation, but also progressive educational legislation. And I am allowing and people from, you know, federal public universities, which is as the one that I work with, I work for, uh, we, uh, we can do, you know, this kind of university extension. Here in the right, in the left, is the definition of uh, university extension by, you know, uh, national policies. And they say that university extension is an educative, cultural and scientific process that articulates teaching and research in an indissoluble manner and enables a transformative re relation between university and society. So the idea is that the knowledge produced within university should go uh, outside the university and also the notion that there is valid knowledge outside the university to inform you know, scientific, scientific uh, knowledge produced within the, the academic world. So that is why what we hold for in order to, to do all, all the kind of stuff that, that we do. So monitor the implementation of right to the city policies in became a fer fertile ground for education extension initiatives in my department. I mean, in a culture and urban school all over Brazil, but I'm kind of uh, talking about my case here in, in the Northeast. And uh, for us, this, uh, Believing that there is valid knowledge outside of the books, you know, in real life, is very aligned with what I have uh, been reading about and trying to contribute to the theory of insurgent planning, you know. And I have written somewhere else about, you know, the relation between right to the city policies and insurgent planning, and the idea that uh, we we should dialogue with states, but also against the states. You know, this idea, you know, the finite notion of uh, in, invited and invented spaces that we have to plan both within and, and outside the state. Uh, that's who we are, you know, the architect is the name of the program, Programa de Educação Tutorial, uh, and, you know, the, our, our room, some, some students. Uh, and we try, what we try to do is, is know exactly what, what you, you know, all of us are trying to do is to build different visions because the, the dominant vision about informal settlements and precarious settlements, it, it's one that equates them with de degradation. You know, this is the, the guy, local newspaper headline saying that there is a degradation, you know, degradation, urban blight uh, due to the presence of informal settlements. And on the right, you have, you know, uh, formal plan vision for the same area. So the, the vision is to destroy the segment and to build this kind of development. And what we try to do is, you know, build an alternative vision. So uh, this is another example that we, we have tried. We have developed what we call the a Plano Popular, just in, in a dialogue with the university and this peripheral community of Bon Jardin. And before, after we developed this uh, popular plan, we were uh, commissioned by municipal government to develop the, the formal, you know, uh, plan for the neighborhood. This is, you know, some pictures of us uh, doing, talking with residents and also some of the products of, with, of our vision, which is very different from state's formal plan vision. You know, it's one that recognizes value, um, recognize value and, and benefit of the existing built environment. 
and try to respond to the challenges that already exist and not to, to destroy everything and substitute with someone that's something else that they, they cannot see themselves, you know, living. And, you know, as students have, I have been doing this for 12 years now, and as the students keep following uh, us, doing all that, you know, dialoguing with state agencies and, and going to all these places, they have also developed some capstone projects and some visions themselves. So this, are one of the examples in you know, Comunidade de Desmares where the students have, you know, developed, the same, have made the same kind of exercise to, uh, to plan uh, considering, uh, considering demands that are not present in the official uh, democratic master plan. So, this is, you know, a very, I mean, a very touch, a very important moment in my career when I saw the community of uh, the fabulous community in a public hearing with a sign saying that we we demand one of my students' alternative design proposal. So I think that for me that is something that moves me in this context of uh, very bad negative uh, political context. When I see that uh, my students have been have learned to dialogue with president and have learned to influence the decision making process, and I, I kind of think that this is the the, the function of, of university and academic and knowledge production. So this is the, the I think the second the, almost the last slide here. It's what we are doing now. We have been been following monitoring the implementation of the the plan that we have been commissioned to to develop. So we, we uh, represent the university in this uh, state uh, municipal forums for, for implementing ZAIDs. And you know, each, each neighborhood has, has its own, has their own um, t-shirt saying that they are this special zone, so they deserve investments and they have rights to their land. And uh, lastly, oh, there was one. Uh, there was another one. Yes. So that is what, in dialoguing with this, uh, these people, we have realized that we have a lot of data that counters what state says that, that their demands are. And we have decided to teach the residents to manipulate the data we have produced because some uh, eventually we are going to, go out from, from uh, assisting that community. But if we have you know, the residents able to manipulate the data about their community, they might be able to dialogue in a more you know, equal, equal manner with uh, state agents. So that is what I have been doing now in 2022. You know, this is a last week picture because you know, even data about informal settlements, it's, it's absent in, in formal state uh, data. So we are kind of empowering residents to manipulate and to dialogue through data. And lastly, mm -hmm. so, it was just a quote from, I think I had a problem. Yes, it was just a quote from Peter Marcus obituary, oh, well, taken from his obituary when he said, uh, that he saw, that he said, uh, not wanting to be limited by the merely possible, he defined transformative planning as an approach combining what can be done now with raising what should be done in the future. So if we don't lose sign of what should be done in the future, in order for us not to be paralyzed, we might be able to do something now, even though it's a very small step, but if it's a step in the right direction, we should you know, continue to do it. And, and that, that is my message, that, that is what moves me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Roberto and everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Clarissa. That was uh, wonderful. You raised so many super relevant um, points 
And especially for me personally, how you highlight that we as planners or designers can really be complicit to uh, sort of the, the, the ideas and the plans of the, uh, of, of, of the elites, let's say. But on the other hand, we're also really responsible to make sure that we include the, the voices and the, the needs of those that are voiceless. And I think what you show with your students, it's really beautiful. It shows that we a, a different way is possible and you can have an impact, not only as a designer, but also as, as a student. And that sort of really uh, makes me hopeful. Uh, but I think too often we think, oh, there's nothing we can do. And what, what can we do as students, you know, but you really show that you can make a difference. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I, I want to open the floor maybe for, for questions from the audience. Uh, so before before the, the audience speaks, uh, Clarissa, thank you so very much for bringing your experience here and for bringing this experience of, um, you know, putting the students, also the work of the students at the center. And also something you said was super nice that uh, there is a lot of knowledge outside of the university and we shouldn't uh, pretend that uh, designers know everything. They actually don't know much and they need to reach out to, to the community, right? To, to learn, I think, but, um, I see lots of friends around, lots of friends. I want to say a good uh, hello, Gina, hello. But uh, questions from the audience. Shazad. Yes. Hi, hi, hi everyone. Uh, it's good to be uh, present here. I'm from India and uh, I, along with my group of students are uh, participating in this. So uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I just want to um, raise a question regarding uh, regarding what has been said and what has been presented on the slide. So there was one statement. Uh, I am quoting that political practices of marginalized residents might bend state planning policies towards collective problems. So within this uh, overview, I am. Uh, I, I want to highlight the case of South Indian cities as a case of a global South. So marginalized sections, there could be two types of marginalization in my country. One is the people who are native of India, who are citizens of India. They are also on a marginalized line, on a sidelines, both politically and resource wise. The other part of marginalized communities are those communities which are refugees coming from neighboring countries, uh, war, uh, political con conditions like uh, earlier. So in a, in, a, in a democratic setup, when the democracy approves the marginalized communities uh, coming from outside and they are inclusive of their uh, needs and rights, they give them space, they give them rights. Example, Tibet, Tibet was uh, like Chinese and in accession and all. So in the earlier 1950s, they came here, but they are not welcomed here. It becomes a political issue. So my, my, my actual question is, uh, how does the, this 21st century politicization of everything for internal gains is going to bend the political practices or decision making in favor of the marginal people or bringing about the collective problems because everybody is divided. Everybody tends to bring his his or own uh, pol uh, problems, be it of resourcefulness, be it for rights, reservations, whatever. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. Uh, I would just ask uh, everybody making a thank you so much, Shazad, for your question. Let's try to keep the questions a bit compact because we have very little time, so uh, we need to give time uh, for everyone to speak. Clarissa, would you like to react to Shazad's? Um, question. So I think that the question to respond in itself, because uh, as you thought, uh, we are living in a very complicated moment that we don't dialogue. So if, if we don't dialogue, there, it, it's difficult for us to talk about, you know, the technicalities of, of planning. And so, yes, we have to look for this larger picture and understand that there are conflicts of interest and it just, just 
uh, start uh, recognizing that planning is not not really the technical solution for a problem. We, we need, really need to define first the problem in, in this broader perspective. And, and people need to see this broader perspective. So that's also why I, I believe in spaces such as this one that allows my students to understand that their, our local problems are very similar to, you know, Indian problems and, you know, Iranian problems and, and all problems all over the world. So maybe this would be, uh, I, I believe this is an important step for us. Start dialoguing globally. Thank you so much, Lizzie. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your speech, Professor Freitas. It was great. I am a postdoc from the University of Catania in Sicily, Italy. And I may have many questions, but I want to keep short. So I have like two questions, two reflections to have together. One is like more theoretical. Uh, I studied very much during my PhD, the just city concept and how it was envisioned and a bit which was the debate all around. And I would like to ask you if you think that in order to really reach a just city, we should propose more strongly as a planner community, a methodological tar, because we you were talking about this hybrid ground between university and society. And that's is not always everyone is doing actual research, not everyone is doing engaged research and not always within the just city debate, you have this very, you know, engage, engaged way to make a research to do planning. So do you think it could be interesting to, you know, add a layer of you know, the reflection on the just city debate with also this, also theoretically um, um, suggesting a methodological term that is more strong, if this makes sense, hopefully. It's clear. And then is like more a practical question. I, I am um, teaching now with some students and we are working in some very powerless distress area. And you say something during your speech uh, that uh, the learning process of your student has influenced the decision making process, which sounds to me great, like the one of the goals to reach. Can you a bit explain how this was possible? What do you actually have done in order to do in a way that students have influenced the decision making process? And thank you very much for also the organizer. Thank you very much for organizing this. Uh, sorry, I, I haven't I haven't got the second question. I mean, how my students have done what? Hi, uh, you say they have influenced the decision making process. The learning process of your students. Then you say because I mean, for a matter of time, you could not unpack more this. Maybe you can a bit tell something on how they have done so. Thank you. Yes, uh, thanks, thanks for the question and for the opportunity for me to explain more that episode. Yes, the, for the first question, I, I do agree with what you said, that theory needs to observe practice, to observe the existing uh, reality. And sometimes we are very detached from what is happening on the ground. I mean, if I, if I would you know, stay inside university walls, and reading with my students without going to and, and taking them to what's happened outside of the walls, uh, we would not come to the same conclusions. So we need to, to go outside and to produce this kind of engaged knowledge. And that is something that Professor Fernack has uh, teached me, has taught me a lot, which she was a very influence in, in, my, in my way of thinking. So, and, and about the episode, that the residents, you know, uh, demanded in, in that public hearing, demanded the alternative design proposal of, of my students. It was it was an interesting episode while she was her name is Lara Bahir, and she was developing an, a counter proposal for a, a state proposal of eviction of that neighborhood and uh, municipal. It was you know a few years before the World Cup in Fortaleza and, you know, municipal government was trying to uh, amir ameliorate, you know, improve and make the city looks beautiful. And of course, a great part of this is evicting the informal settlements on the coast side of the city. And she decided that she would do a counter proposal, but she decided that she would first talk with residents and listen to them with, you know, what, what, do they, what are their real demands 
And I think what happened was that she had a very strong, developed a, a bond with residents and residents came you know, to, to, to see the explanation of, of her capstone project. And she, has, she presented to residents what she was proposing. And so it, it was natural that when they went to the public hearing, they said, okay, university has already developed something that would benefit us. And that also would improve the image of the city, which is what you know, municipal government wants. So it's, it's this kind of bond that develops informally between you know, university and people and, and residents that I found it to be very profitable. Well, if I may, I think it's a, beyond the bond, it's also the trust, right, that you develop. Yes. What do you think, Clarissa? Yes. Uh, okay, we have uh, we have uh, one of uh, our own students from Tudel, Faker. Hello, I'm Faker. I'm yeah from the uh, TU Delft study urban the master urbanism, and I was wondering in how uh, we as urbanism students, but also in our wider fields, can hold um, our uh, faculties, but also the urbanism and architecture practice better to account such as um, the University of Delft taking large amounts of money from the oil company Shell, or for example, big architects like Bjarke Ingels working with uh, Jair Bolsonaro to, um, to further their plans. How can we counteract this movement within our, uh, within our faculties and within the urbanist world? Well, yes, that, that is a question that I really don't know the answer. What, what I, I try to, to tell here is the true story that I am only able to do what I do because I have the backing of, you know, an uh, educational policy that might even, you know, be destroyed by, by President Jair Bolsonaro in, in a few months, in years ahead, I don't know. So it's, it's this um, relation between education and democracy and democratic government. I mean, in Brazil, we do have a lot, we still do have a lot of government research funding, even though we have been, you know, diminishing the, the public research funding has been diminishing a lot. So funding is a big issue. And uh, I think maybe international funding or, you know, maybe this global conversation might be able to, 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 to bring up some alternatives to that. And I think, yes, I, I do believe that, you know, the next generation might be able to, to spread the word about the, the, the problems of uh, education being funded, you know, being sold as a commodity, not as a, a, a social, uh, something that should, should improve, you know, life of everybody. So I, I don't really have the, the answer for that. It's just... Yes, I, I just want to be honest about what I do. It's not really my, it, it's the, the, the fact that I'm lucky to be in a context that is still up for now is allowing me to do that. Um, there's a question in the chat. Um, thanks, Faker, for, for the question. Uh, and I think you should absolutely hold the university accountable, right? Uh, there's a question in the chat from Kamachi Priya. Uh, would you like to say it or? Maybe I can read it. Uh, yes, sir. Like, uh, there are uh, many uh, religions, race, and uh, so many geographical conflicts in every every country, I think, that is uh, present over there. So as a planner or an architecture student and a practitioner, like, how can the indifferences could be dealt with? Like, there are so many problems that can arise with these indifferences. For example, the security problem or anything out of the cultural difference, so many problems could be arrived. So uh, I just want to know like how it can be dealt, like when a city planning or uh, uh, urban spaces should be uh, dealt with, how can we deal with these indifferences? It, it can be a safe place for everyone to coexist. Thank you. Clarissa. Yes, I don't know, this is a very broad question. And uh, my, my feeling is that um, maybe we should connect and unite, you know, and, and uh, sometimes I think that the, the key for, for answer on questions such as that, it's something that I keep telling to myself, which was the message in that last slide, is that sometimes we are not able to do nothing 
for today, but we have to envision the future, you know? So don't let the, the current context freezes you and, and take out the, the belief that we do have, you know, in contributing somehow. So maybe looking into the problem in a broader angle, be it, you know, geographic scale, be it through, you know, more a broader historical process, we, we might be able to, to see, you know, some possibilities of, of changes that the current context of the today and now in the local context, don't let us see that. That, that is what I would say, you know, as a professor. <laughs> Can I, can I just add something to that? Be, because indeed it's a very challenging uh, question, but you, when you talk about sort of connecting and uniting, if I think uh, of the question also from this um, perspective of a spatial practitioner, of an architect or a designer, we can think of how we can uh, design spaces that uh, invite people, very different people, just to use those spaces and at least to be in shared spaces, although we are very different and get to know this, this difference, get to know these others and, and create sort of, um, yeah, start, start to unite, sort of overcoming these differences. I think that is something we can contribute to as uh, spatial thinkers. Yes, uh, and I think that that is what society uh, expects from us, from architects, yeah. that we should not be paralyzed. I mean, sometimes uh, on the first capstone project that, that, that I have advised, students would come to me and say, I will not design that because that is never going to be built. And I would tell them, that is the reason why you should design that, because we are dreamers. I mean, th this is part of our you know, profession. So if we don't design it, it would never be built. So society expects us to uh, make a solution to that problem different from what society envisions. That, that is our goal. And yeah, okay. may, uh, yeah, may I jump in here as well? Uh, uh, just a second. Uh, okay. Because we had a question from the, from the uh, before you uh, speak, uh, Casey. Sorry, go on. Yes, yeah, that's my question. Yeah, please. it's your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's a very good um, starting point to talk about just city is that the informal settlement definitely because like Taiwan in my case, I I took my students uh, for social responsibility projects as well. This is what we call it here, social responsibility of university, and mm -hmm. and so um, the questions we have here is that we have a, such a huge divide. Like we have a uh, high tech industries, yet immediately next to it are a lot of um, uh, um, outrun houses or, you know, settlements of a low, lower incomes. And, or maybe single, fam single parent family, you know, um, a lot of uh, social needs and attention to that. Yet they are sitting next to say semiconductor powerhouse. So it's a huge contrast of, you know, what's happening there. So the challenge that I'm, we have been facing here in Taiwan's experience is that uh, if we can involve once and twice, that's fun, that's fun for students. But the longer term empowerment, the longer term staying with them is the critical um, difficulties, I mean, that we are facing as a, as a you know, um, university because the longer term commitment has to be there and the community has to find a niche and we have to find a niche for the community. So the question is, how do we sustain the efforts that we started and, and become a more sustainable model where the community really, the knowledge we input to their community first is really what they want and what they need, not just what they want, right? And it's to add, to, to find out, to be able to identify what's real um, for them. And, and another thing is that um, the children, for us as urban designers, we go in there and we can, we can see a lot of things need to be done. We clean them up. Yeah, that's the loss, the touch of humanity. Sometimes that what we do become uh, another exclusion 
<laughs> interference. Thank, thanks a lot. Let's, uh, let Clarissa, would yeah. you like to react? Yes, I mean, you pose a set of questions that we pose every day here. You know, every time that you say, okay, next year, I'm not gonna have a fellow student working, uh, available to work in that community, but we cannot leave that behind in what we do. So what I try to do is to, because, you know, every time as I work, the more and more communities and more and more people we know, and, and so we can, you know, time is very limited for time and resources for, you know, the, the, the scale of the problem is huge. So what I have, what has happened to me was sometimes, you know, even after the student graduate, he keeps uh, going to that community and, and trying to contribute somehow to the urban challenge, to their urban challenge. And he does that, you know, as uh, just, just as ethical, you know, values or sometimes as a way of inserting himself in a more socially responsible uh, professional uh, envision for him. So that some students have uh, uh, formed collective of you know of uh, architects to to apply to 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 calls for funding in some some in some sort of ways. That is one response. Another response is what I'm trying to do now is to uh, make the residents uh, able to uh, not only to read and to understand and to talk, you know. To, to manipulate the data that we have produced, you know, telling them, them that we are not going to be here all the time. And also being very clear that uh, my goal is to, um, and I, I tell them all the time that my primary goal is to uh, form future professionals. It's, and through this goal, I, I try to make it visible the, the problems and, and the struggles of the, the community. But the, the, the goal of fighting for their problems is their goal. I mean, the university cannot substitute the, the civic practices and the political practices. Of, so we, we don't occupy, you know, in, in this public um, dialogue, public arena. I, I stand, I am within the university. I am not the resident. And I, I can never substitute the perspective of the people who live in, in these places. So I think that sometimes, you know, having these roles very clear, it helps for us to contribute. Guys, um, we are getting thank to, uh, thank you so much, Clarissa. Uh, we are getting to, uh, close to our uh, time limit uh, and we have a few things to do after the lecture, and after the questions and more discussion uh, in which I hope everybody will participate more actively. Um, it's it's better when everybody participates. If you if you if you feel you cannot ask your question now, put it on the chat. Uh, uh, write to us, but uh, write to Clarice. I think her email is easily findable on the internet, so you can uh, spam her. But Clarissa and Faranak, uh, on behalf of the Delft University of Technology and all, of all the universities that are helping us um, organize this because we have a lot of teachers from around the world who have taken this um, uh, activity as a class activity. Faranak is one of them. Russell is another one. Bruno uh, uh, and Arnold. Um, a, a lot of people have taken this as a, as a, as a class activity. Thank you so very, very much. Um, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, quite a lot. There is a, a huge list of people who who, who are taking this. Um, today is a, a so Faranak and uh, Clarissa. Let's all give them. A... Okay. Thank you so much, <laughs> Clarissa. Thank you for excellent talk, and as always, thank you for the collective organizing this. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Bye -bye. Guys, we have a, a, a little bit more to offer you um, uh, in this session. This session is going to be a little bit different from the next ones because in the next ones, you will talk among yourselves. But today, because we had a, a, a little bit more content in the beginning, uh, we are going to have a five minute, uh, a five minute uh, break. So it's a, a 15 past here in the Netherlands. And we are going to be back at 20 past. And then we are going to, to have a, a communal talk using Mentimeter, okay? 
and we are going to answer all your questions about how to write and how to organize the groups for the manifesto because I know there are lots and lots of questions. So see you in five minutes. Thanks. Okay. See you. Thanks, Alberto and everybody. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, Clarissa. Awesome.